The unexpected We Need to Talk bombshell dropped on a Sunday evening as we were preparing to turn in for the night. I shouldn't have been taken aback, really, considering Maggie, my wife of four years, had been exhibiting odd behavior all weekend. Despite my inquiries about her well-being, she insisted she was fine, albeit burdened with thoughts weighing heavily on her mind. In all honesty, I was grappling with my own share of concerns. The aftermath of the Great Recession had sent both of our careers into a tailspin, turning our once promising financial situation into a struggle to make ends meet. It wasn't just us. Our peers were facing similar challenges. Unlike me, though, Maggie seemed particularly resistant to accepting our financial downturn. Having grown up with less, she had grown accustomed to the luxuries we once indulged in, like our annual vacations, while she never explicitly pointed fingers at me. Hints of blame lingered in her remarks whenever our finances were discussed. As I embraced Maddie, expressing my love for her, her response was devoid of reciprocation. Instead, she did something entirely uncharacteristic, pouring herself a strong shot of scotch without offering me one. It was evident she had something significant, likely unpleasant, to share, and she was steeling herself to broach the subject. After dinner, the evening passed in silence as we sat in front of the TV. I couldn't tell you what programs aired. My mind was preoccupied with concern for my wife. Without tuning into the news, we headed upstairs, a routine that typically signaled an intimate moment between us. However, tonight diverged from the norm. In fact, for the past three weeks, intimacy had eluded us, a victim of the economic strain we faced. As I finished brushing my teeth, she entered the bathroom and dropped a bombshell. Someone from work invited me on an all-expenses-paid ski trip to Colorado. One person had to cancel, and the tickets are non-refundable. We're leaving Wednesday morning, and I'll return on Monday. Rinsing my mouth, I couldn't help but comment, someone from work. That's an interesting way to put it. It leads me to believe it was a man who extended the invitation. Maggie appeared stricken with guilt. I believe you just answered my question. So... Who is this man from work who invited you, a married woman, on vacation? I endeavored to maintain composure. You don't know him. I thought I was familiar with everyone you work with. You are, but I don't directly work with him. Now you've lost me. You mentioned someone from work. No, I said someone at work. You mentioned someone from work. No, I said someone at work. All right. Let's not resort to Bill Clinton-esque semantics. Who's the individual who invited you on vacation? He's someone I met in the office cafeteria. His office is on the fifth floor, and we've had lunch together a few times. I struggle to keep my emotions in check, but my voice resonated through the room. How long has this affair been going on? Maggie began to cry. Amidst her sobs, she protested, I would never betray you. How could you say something so hurtful? Perhaps because you neglected to mention your lunch dates with another man, or the fact that you've become such close friends that he invited you, a married woman, on a skiing trip to Colorado. And it's been nearly a month since we've been intimate. I believe that covers it. It's not what you think. He's genuinely a nice guy, but his girlfriend recently broke up with him, and he doesn't want to waste the prepaid ticket. Everything from the hotel to the lift tickets is already covered. It won't cost me a thing. How convenient. Now, what's his name? I demanded, my voice rising. Joseph. Does Joseph have a last name? Brown or Bryant, something along those lines. You've got me so flustered, I can't remember. So, you're planning to fly across the country with a man whose name you can't even recall. You're either having an affair with him or you're being incredibly foolish. The argument escalated in volume and intensity. At some point, I inquired, who exactly are these friends you'll be sharing the cabin with? They're friends of Joseph's. There are two other couples. Two other couples, which means you're essentially going as his date. No, I keep telling you. He just doesn't want to waste the non-refundable ticket. So, he's asked a married woman to accompany him. Why can't you trust me? 
Would you trust me if I said I met a woman in the cafeteria who invited me on vacation? Yes. That's nonsense. Remember how jealous you got when I was simply explaining the infield fly rule to that woman sitting beside us at Wrigley Field last summer? You started a fight with her, and we got thrown out of the ballpark by the ushers. That was different. You were ignoring me. Oh, and you won't be ignoring me when you're holed up in a cabin with Joseph and four complete strangers, I retorted. Maggie let out a scream before storming out of the room. The night stretched on endlessly, filled with restless tossing and turning. Eventually, around two in the morning, exhaustion overtook us both. By six, I was already up, brewing a pot of coffee. Maggie joined me, taking the sip before dumping the contents down the sink. I'm heading to work, she announced. I knew Maggie's stubbornness well. When she dug her heels in, admitting fault was out of the question. She was perhaps the most obstinate person I had ever met. During the drive to work, I contemplated how to salvage our relationship. Logic wouldn't suffice this time. It called for a more drastic approach, as my grandmother would say. Around a year ago, I had taken a chance by hiring Nick, a street-smart young man with a criminal past. He often reminded me of his gratitude for giving him a second chance. You name it, boss, and I'll do it he would say. I decided it was time to cash in on that favor. Nick, I need your help. Whatever it is, just say the word. I laid out my dilemma for Nick. You want me to rough him up? Maybe later, but first I need his name and place of work. I handed Nick a photo of my wife and the address of her office building. There's a cafeteria in the basement where she goes for lunch every day at noon. I need you to discreetly snap a photo of Joseph. Once he's done eating, follow him upstairs and find out where he works. Get me the name of his employer. Understood, boss. And when it's time to leave, tail him and get the license plate number of his car. You can count on me, boss. And Nick, don't fret. I'll make sure your time card is taken care of. I constantly checked my watch convinced that Maggie would rendezvous with her paramour to discuss my supposed unreasonableness. The day progressed like any typical Monday, buried under heaps of work with time moving at a snail's pace. At 1.10, my phone chimed. Boss, it's me. I've got the picture. They were deep in conversation, but I couldn't get close enough to eavesdrop. Afterward, I trailed him to the elevator. He didn't acknowledge my presence. I followed him off and pretended to search for a room number. He slipped into 510, the sign read Anderson Metallurgy Supplies, LLC. Nick, excellent work, but you're only halfway there. Don't worry, boss, I'll shadow him like a ghost. Send me the picture. As soon as I ended the call, Google filled my screen. Typing in Joseph Brown, I wasn't overly hopeful. I found numerous matches for the name but none resembling the man in the photo. Trying Bryant yielded no results either. I then searched for Anderson Metallurgy Supplies, LLC, discovering they were a major supplier of powdered metals to the industry. Despite my efforts, I couldn't find any employee names or photos. I dialed the listed number and inquired about Joseph Brown. There's no one here by that name. My apologies, I must have made an error. I meant Joseph Bryant. No one by that name works here either. Are you sure you have the correct company? I must have dialed incorrectly. Apologies for the confusion. Staring at the computer screen, I pondered how to uncover the identity of that individual when my phone rang once more. Boss, it's me. Right after we hung up, I slipped into the men's room for a smoke. Guess who followed me? Bryant but none of those names are his real one. Did he spot you? Nah. I was in the stall about to light up when he walked in. I kept an eye on him through the gap between the wall and the door. He took a leak but didn't bother washing his hands. On his way out, a guy around my age greeted him as Mr. Bennett. Bryant didn't say a word, so I waited until the other guy left and asked, Hey, was that Joseph Bryant? He just shook his head and said, Nope, that's Lester Bennett. 
Sounds like a real piece of work. You can say that again. He bummed a cigarette off me, and I headed outside. Nick, you make a hell of a spy. Thanks, boss. Unfortunately, I got pulled into a logistics meeting that ran right up until quitting time, so I couldn't do any further digging. That would have to wait until morning. As I was maneuvering my car into the garage, Nick rang up. He exited the elevator a few minutes before three, and I trailed him across the parking lot to the subway station. The train was packed, so I hung around the other end of the car with a group of Spanish-speaking Mexicans. Bennett seemed wary of us. He clutched his briefcase tightly, as if he thought we might snatch it. He got off at Logan Square, and I followed him home. He resides in the basement apartment of a two-story building, about a block off the boulevard. The address is 2366 North Kimball Avenue. There are burglar bars on the windows, but no curtains so I could see inside. It's quite run down. With nothing else to do, I lingered in the nearby gangway to see if he made any other stops. About ten minutes later, he emerged with a stack of pizza boxes, tossing them into the garbage cart. Then he returned with two hefty garbage bags. Once he went back inside, I seized both bags. That's how my associates typically steal identities. People discard a lot of valuable stuff. Boss, I couldn't find any trace of Brian Brown, but I did uncover a slew of legal documents indicating his name is Lester Bennett. Nick, that's excellent work. I can't discuss this any further right now. We'll debrief tomorrow. Got it, boss. Armed with this newfound information, an idea sparked in my mind. I entered the house and discovered Maggie enjoying a hamburger and fries at the kitchen table. It seemed she hadn't thought to get anything for me. Disregarding the oversight, I took a seat opposite her. For us to have a rational discussion, I insist on a few things. Maggie began, but I interrupted her, requesting her patience until I finished speaking. I'm not oblivious. I remember how you framed your vacation announcement to suggest you were going with a female colleague. So now it's time for complete transparency. I require Joseph's last name, address, email address, cell phone number, and workplace details. Additionally, I'll need copies of the plane tickets and the address of the mountain chalet he rented. In the unfortunate event something were to happen to you, I wouldn't want to be clueless about your whereabouts or companions. Don't exaggerate, Maggie interjected. I halted her once more. I'll speak first, then you. It always irked my wife when I didn't allow her to talk over me. I also need the names and phone numbers of the other couples. Now you may respond. He didn't rent the chalet. It's owned by his uncle. And Joseph doesn't own a cell phone. What do you mean? Even five-year-olds have cell phones. Practically everyone does. Well, he doesn't. So, if I provide you with all of this, will you stop pressuring me and let me enjoy myself? Her face lit up with a hopeful smile. You have one day to gather everything. Why don't you just admit you're jealous because I'm going to Colorado? I slammed my fist on the table. I'm not jealous. I'm furious because throughout our entire relationship and the four-plus years of marriage, you never once mentioned a desire to go skiing anywhere. Now suddenly you're adamant about going skiing in Colorado with some guy you barely know from the cafeteria, and you're surprised I suspect you're having an affair. I swear I'm not. She screamed. Get me the information. If it checks out, then we'll talk. I was tempted to reveal that her boyfriend had given her a false name, but I wanted to gauge Bennett's reaction first. We slept as far apart as the queen-size mattress would allow, but surprisingly, Maggie was civil the next morning, and we even shared coffee together. I arrived early at the office, pacing anxiously until Nick showed up. With tomorrow being Maggie's departure date, this was my final chance to salvage my marriage. Nick brought in a large cardboard box. He had sifted through the bags, discarding actual garbage and preserving everything else. Financial records, bank statements, and certified mail from a law firm. He tore the envelopes in half, thinking it would deter identity theft. 
I pieced together anything that seemed important and organized them, Nick explained. The first item he handed me was a legal-sized envelope addressed to Lester Bennett, sent via certified mail. That scumbag is being taken to court for failing to pay child support. He's got two young kids, and he hasn't contributed a cent in over a year. The following item was a bench warrant for failure to appear for non-payment of child support. Nick elaborated, The police are so swamped, they won't even bother coming to your house to pick you up. Instead, they input your name into the database. If you have any interaction with law enforcement, even for a minor infraction like a traffic violation, they'll haul you off to jail. So, I suppose I'll need to orchestrate an encounter with Chicago's finest, I remarked dryly. Nick chuckled. That's a solid plan, boss. Next in the stack were overdraft notices and checks stamped NSF. He received a barrage of notices from the bank before they finally closed his account, Nick reported. Saving the juiciest piece for last, Nick handed me a printout of the airline reservations. It's peculiar. His ticket is round trip, but your wife's is only one way. That's troubling, I muttered. Boss, with the record identifier, you can cancel the tickets, Nick suggested. I had another idea. I would separate the lovebirds by altering Bennett's seat assignment to the rear of the plane and purchasing the newly vacant one for myself. After scrutinizing all the documents, I delved into the archives of the Chicago Tribune and uncovered the reason behind Bennett's use of a false identity. Shockingly, he was a convicted rapist. Although the assault took place in Denver, Bennett was a Chicago native, and all three major newspapers ran the story alongside his mugshot. While the details were scarce due to a plea agreement to spare the victim from trial, it was evident it was him. He pleaded guilty to a reduced charge of sexual assault and received a 24-month sentence. During his stint in prison, his wife filed for divorce, severing ties with him. A visit to the sex offender registry confirmed his residential address and cautioned about his early release after serving just 14 months due to prison overcrowding. Upon release, his first act was to track down his ex-wife and viciously assault her, leaving her hospitalized for nearly a month. With two felony convictions under his belt, my wife somehow viewed him as a decent individual. I took an early lunch break and headed to the courthouse to purchase a copy of Bennett's divorce decree, with photocopying fees amounting to 25 cents per sheet. Alongside the divorce filing, I obtained a copy of his rape arrest warrant. It revealed the chilling details of how he drugged and assaulted a young woman during a skiing trip. Further, I researched do-it-yourself divorced filings at the law library, discovering a comprehensive template online. I filled it out, citing adultery as grounds and appended timestamp photos of Bennett and my wife engaged in intimate conversation in the cafeteria for a solid hour, akin to two lovers deeply engaged. My final destination was the Circuit Court of Cook County Domestic Relations Division, where I formally filed my petition for dissolution of marriage. I had three copies made, each bearing the official seal and a stamped case number. Informing my supervisor of my need for a few personal days off, he didn't inquire further, showing understanding and support. Upon returning home, I found Maggie preparing dinner, a genuine home-cooked meal rather than something from a package. It seemed like her effort to lift my spirits. I embraced her and planted a kiss, though her response wasn't as enthusiastic as I hoped. Still, any sign of affection was welcome. Maggie then retrieved the folded piece of paper from her purse. Here, I gathered everything you asked for. Joseph Brown doesn't have a phone, but I managed to get his email address. He's also active on Facebook. Where does he work? I inquired. He recently got a promotion and hasn't received his new business cards yet, she explained casually. I stared at her incredulously, puzzled by her lack of concern. And oddly enough, he couldn't recall the name of his employer. Opening my laptop, I navigated to Google Maps, inputting the Chalade's address. Strike one. Then I attempted the official Denver zoning map. Strike two. Despite trying various mapping programs, including the assessor's webpage, all yielded the same result. 
the address didn't exist. He must have made an error, perhaps transposed a digit, Maggie offered. What about the tickets? I pressed. He mentioned we'll collect them at the airport. No, you received the boarding pass at the airport. You should know that from our trip to Maui. I reminded her. I dialed the phone numbers provided for the other two couples, but neither connected to a working line. Online searches for their names also turned up empty, and I found no trace of them on Facebook. Honey, I hate to break it to you, but none of the information provided by Brown, if that's even his real name, checks out. There's no way I'm allowing you to go. Navely, I hoped she would acknowledge the suspicious nature of Brown's actions. Instead, before I knew it, my dinner, still sizzling in the frying pan, was flung across the room, shattering against the wall. It was a shame, as it had smelled delicious. You're not letting me, she screamed. Who you think you are to dictate where I can go? Your husband. Why are you being so unreasonable? I'm simply going skying with a friend. With a man who has deceived you at every turn. You don't even know where you're headed. He didn't deceive me. Maybe he's trying to protect us from your interference. Is he afraid I'll crash your rendezvous and spoil his seduction? Maggie snapped. Spit flew from her mouth as she shouted. Stop saying that. We're just friends. I'm going skiing, and you can't stop me. If you want to go skiing, fine. I'll take us skiing. You? With what money? We're broke, remember? I have two mayonnaise jars filled with silver coins that I've been saving since my teenage years. I intended to use them for a getaway on our fifth anniversary. Now I'll cash them in, and the choice is yours. We can either use the money for a vacation together, or for legal fees with a divorce attorney. It's up to you. Stop trying to intimidate me. I'm not trying to intimidate you. I'm making a solemn promise, and you know I always keep my word. I don't understand why you don't trust me. You're a beautiful woman. Brown has proven himself to be less than honorable by not respecting your husband's objections to his wife going on vacation with him. I already told you he's only taking me because the ticket is non-refundable. I'll reimburse him for the ticket and still have enough left for us to go skiing. It's too late. We're leaving tomorrow morning, and I have no way to contact him. Maggie, I'm not naive. I will never allow myself to be cuckolded by you. Any man who would permit his wife to do what you're planning isn't a real man. Think about how you'll explain to your parents, family, and friends why we're getting divorced. Don't give me that. I promised I would return relaxed and make it up to you. Please, I'm begging you. It's not too late to salvage our marriage. I already told you I can't cancel. I gave Joseph my word, and it's too late for him to find someone else. So you're willing to uphold your promise to a proven liar at the expense of the vow you made in front of God and all our loved ones. I keep telling you, nothing inappropriate will happen. It doesn't matter if nothing happens. You've made your choice. You've prioritized him over our marriage. That night, I slept on the couch, listening to Maggie's tears from the bedroom. My mind wrestled with conflicting emotions, the rational part urged me to let her face the consequences and revel in victory when the inevitable occurred, while my heart pleaded for me to be the knight in shining armor and rescue our marriage. I battled through a sleepless night, torn between what I desired. Ultimately, I reached a compromise. Before dawn, I was already up. Maggie ignored me, her annoyance evident when I snapped a photo of her with my phone. Why did you do that? She demanded. So the authorities will have a recent photo in case they need to identify your body. She responded with a barrage of profanities. As she packed her suitcase in the bedroom, I entered and delivered my ultimatum. If you board that plane with him, I won't be here when you return. Our marriage will be over. She shot me a disdainful glance and retorted, I know you're not that foolish. Funny. I thought the same about you. I guess we were both mistaken. Without kissing her goodbye, I exited the house. Parking my car a block away, I observed her departure before returning indoors to shave off my distinctive beard and mustache. Dressed in my somber black suit, white shirt, 
and narrow black tie, what my wife often dubbed my funeral attire, an apt metaphor for the death of our marriage. I completed the look with a pair of sunglasses. Grabbing my briefcase and a couple of suitcases containing my belongings, I embarked on my final gamble. Arriving at the gate, I received a call from Nick a few minutes after eight. He was stationed outside Bennett's basement apartment. Boss, you won't believe this. They had a heated argument. Your wife wanted to drive to the airport, but the guy insisted on taking the subway, claiming it was cheaper. She even offered to cover parking costs, but he refused, stating they'd need the money in Colorado. I took a peek into her wallet while she was in the restroom. She had less than $100. I hoped she didn't plan on using our joint credit cards because I canceled them right after purchasing my ticket. I wished I could read Maggie's thoughts as she struggled with her bags down the stairs into the dim underground maze that Chickagoms call the subway. The Blue Line train would likely be packed with commuters heading to work. Nick found it odd that a man flying to Denver for skiing in December didn't have a proper winter coat or even gloves as they were bumped around by the crowd. Maggie's much-anticipated vacation was already facing turbulence. The journey to the airport took a little over half an hour. Nick discreetly followed them into the terminal, where he observed Bennett printing out their boarding passes. Thankfully, Bennett didn't scrutinize the passes closely, so he didn't notice the last-minute change I made to his seat assignment just before purchasing my own ticket. Nick called again to report that they had reached the TSA checkpoint, beyond which he couldn't follow. Thanks for everything. You've been a tremendous help, I acknowledge. At the x-ray machine, Maggie's carry-on bag drew the screener's attention. Please step over here, ma'am, he instructed. Soon, a TSA agent was meticulously inspecting her belongings, eventually discovering the corkscrew I had surreptitiously placed in the inside zipper pocket during my earlier examination of her bags. To my relief, there was nothing remotely provocative inside. The TSA agent reprimanded her and confiscated the corkscrew. The timing had to be impeccable for my plan to succeed. I had paid for early boarding and secured one of the first seats on the plane, opting for a center seat. My wife was assigned the window seat. I decided to offer her a second chance by leaving the aisle seat vacant, hoping she would sit beside me so I could present her with my evidence. Luck seemed to be on my side when a well-built young man, likely a college athlete, judging by his buzz cut, occupied the aisle seat just minutes later. Gradually, the rows ahead of us filled up as passengers boarded the plane. The stragglers frantically searched the overhead bins for space to stow their carry-on bags. A couple of minutes later, the chaos ensued. Hey, you're in my seat, asshole. Bennett thrust his ticket in my seatmate's face. Maggie had been struggling to fit her suitcase into the overhead compartment and turned back when she heard the commotion. The man in the aisle seat calmly replied, Check the row number. Your seat is further back near the bathrooms. Bennett erupted into a tirade filled with profanity, berating the airline for its incompetence. He concluded with, Move your fat ass to the back of the plane and let me sit next to my girlfriend. Maggie heard him refer to her as his girlfriend but didn't object. Instead, she suggested, Joseph, since he's unwilling, perhaps you should ask the gentleman in the middle to switch seats. Without my beard and mustache, she didn't recognize me immediately, especially with the aid of sunglasses. By this time, a flight attendant had made her way through the crowd, and the purser emerged from the aft galley to investigate the disturbance. Glaring at Bennett, the flight attendant insisted he take his seat so that they could complete the boarding process. This flight is fully booked. Please take your assigned seat, and we'll see if we can accommodate any changes after takeoff. The flight attendant interjected firmly. I paid to sit next to my girlfriend, Bennett exclaimed, brandishing his ticket. It was then that Maggie finally realized I was occupying the center seat. What are you doing on my plane? You orchestrated this. You're humiliating me, she accused me, her voice tinged with anger and embarrassment. I'm humiliating you. You're a married woman, and this guy is referring to you as his girlfriend, I retorted. He only said that to convince him to change sheets. Maggie snapped, her tone dripping with venom. 
She moved into the empty row ahead of me, continuing her outburst. You bastard. I knew you would ruin my vacation. I hate you. I hate being married to you. I braced myself for her anger, but I wasn't prepared for what she said next. It felt like a dagger through my heart. My world shattered. I had lost her. Grabbing my briefcase, I moved to leave the plane, ready to accept the finality of it all. But then something unexpected occurred. Bennett thrust the ticket in my face, and without thinking, I snatched it from him. My voice quivered as I demanded, Tell me whose name is on this ticket. I held it out for her to see. Her expression shifted to confusion. Joseph, who is Lester Bennett? He lunged forward, seizing the ticket and crumpling it into his pocket. No one. He snapped. Sir, please take your seat. The purser interjected firmly, growing impatient. Bennett confronted her, his voice sharp. That's my seat next to my girlfriend. Make him move. The sight of that bastard claiming my wife as his girlfriend jolted me back to reality. Tears streamed down my face as I met my wife's gaze. Lester Bennett is your boyfriend. He's hiding his real name because the nice guy has an outstanding arrest warrant for non-payment of child support. While he's whisking you away on vacation, he's neglecting his own children. I opened my briefcase and handed her a copy of the bench warrant. You might want to read this. Maggie glanced at the document, her voice trembling. Joseph, what is this? Is it true? While you're at it, ask your boyfriend why he didn't arrange for your return ticket. I added, passing her their trip itinerary, which revealed her one-way ticket. Concern etched on her face, Maggie questioned. Joseph, why don't I have a return ticket? Ignoring her inquiry, Bennett continued arguing with the flight attendant. Are you going to tell me he conveniently forgot to mention his two-year stint in jail for assaulting his wife's so brutally she spent nearly a month hospitalized? I have the evidence. Handing her a couple of photos showing the woman's battered face, I continued, That nice guy did this. Joseph, please tell me this isn't true, Maggie pleaded. Bennett remained silent, preoccupied with berating the head flight attendant and the airline. You better make him move or else, he threatened. I did some digging with his real name. Take a look at these newspaper articles if you need proof. I handed her several articles, each featuring his mugshot. In case you doubt me. I don't understand, Maggie admitted, clearly bewildered. Surely he mentioned he's a registered sex offender, I exclaimed, breaking the silence in the plane. Let me jog your memory. He persuaded a naive young lady to join him for a ski trip in Colorado. Instead of hitting the slopes, he drugged her, and he and his buddies took turns assaulting her. She managed to escape after a week of captivity. That landed him four years behind bars. Maggie was in tears. Joseph, please tell me that's not true. But Bennett was too preoccupied arguing with the flight attendant to respond. Try Lester. Lester Bennett. That's his real name. It finally seemed to have registered with Bennett, albeit belatedly. I had foiled his plans. Enraged, he screamed, I'm going to kill you, and lunged at me. However, his punch missed me and landed squarely on the flight attendant's face. Chaos erupted in the narrow aisle. My seatmate, as it turned out, was a starting defensive tackle at a Big Ten college. He swiftly intervened, restraining Bennett until the police handcuffed him. The news hailed him as a hero, and the airline rewarded him with a first-class seat upgrade. Bennett soon discovered that assaulting a member of a flight crew is a felony. His explanation to the police that he didn't intend to hit the flight attendant, but was trying to attack his girlfriend's husband, didn't garner much sympathy. I handed Maggie every piece of incriminating evidence I had collected. I swear to God every word I said is the truth. Maggie stared at the pile of documents without uttering a word. It's over. Now let's go home. I threw my arms open, hoping she would let me embrace her. But instead of responding, she stood in silence, her head bowed, fixated on the floor. Not a single word escaped her lips. And then it got worse. As the police were escorting Bennett off the plane, I heard him screaming over and over, Hey Stevens, I slept with your wife. 
My eyes pleaded with Maggie to refute his claim, to deny it ever happened. But she turned away in silence. An airline security guard informed Maggie and me that we were being turned over to the Chicago Police Department for our involvement in the altercation. As we were being escorted away, I overheard a flight attendant saying, Let the gate agent know three seats just opened up. I silently thanked the heavens. As we passed by, the other passengers stared at us, some clicking pictures with their cell phones. Now Maggie knew the true meaning of humiliation. Throughout her walk of shame, she didn't utter a single word. It seemed like she was still processing what had just transpired. I too felt numb. My knees threatened to buckle, and I had to focus hard to keep walking. Despite it all, I managed to hold my head up high. I wanted everyone to know that I had done everything in my power. Everything went according to plan. Almost. I had saved Maggie, but lost my wife in the process. The police escorted us to separate rooms for questioning, with Homeland Security also present. I spent the next hour detailing everything I knew about Bennett to the detective. He instructed me to wait, leaving me alone with a cup of stale coffee for the next two hours while they contacted their counterparts in Denver. During that time, I paced back and forth, feeling like a prisoner, grappling with the possible demise of my marriage. Was my wife involved with Bennett, or was he orchestrating this to tear us apart? If she wasn't involved, why didn't she deny it? The question swirled endlessly in my mind. Finally, the detective returned with grave news. They had received a chilling confirmation from Colorado. Your wife had a severe reaction when shown the pictures they sent over of the chalet, a decrepit structure tucked away in an auto salvage yard, and the horrors awaiting her inside. Bennett had four accomplices, the infamous two couples, waiting at the shack. They had equipped it with restraints and sedatives, intending to incapacitate her upon arrival. We found enough sedatives hidden in his bag to knock out a circus elephant for a week. Upon interrogation, they divulged their sinister plans for their next victim, your wife. It became evident that her fate would have been grim. The detective recounted how all color drained from her face as they confessed their intentions, causing her to faint on the spot. After the detective finished, he asked if I wanted to speak privately with my wife. It wasn't so much a question as a directive. Yes, sir, I replied. Unlocking my briefcase, I retrieved the divorce petition. The detective's curiosity prompted him to inquire, What's that? It's what I told Maggie I would do if she got on the plane with Bennett, I explained. The detective's tone turned grave. Have you no compassion? Your wife is shattered, on the brink of despair. She's reeling from the shock of nearly facing death. You orchestrated all of this to save your marriage, and handing her that will only crush her. My resolve remained firm. The part of me that once loved her seemed to have perished. Right now, you're her hero. You executed a daring plan to rescue her. You're like Liam Neeson in those movies. You can't abandon her now. I broke down. Even after everything she's done, if Maggie sincerely apologizes, I'll tear these papers up. I promise, but you can't let her know. You have my word, he assured me. Moments later, he brought my wife into the room. I stole a quick glance at her before she buried her face in her hands. She looked pale and smelled the vomit. Collapsing into the chair, she began sodding uncontrollably. The detective's stern voice cut through the room. Mrs. Stevens, in my twenty-nine years as a police officer, what you did ranks as one of the most foolish acts I've ever seen. If anyone ever deserved to be a victim, it's you. You should be thanking God and your husband for every breath you take and every heartbeat you have. You owe him your life. As the door clicked shut behind the detective, the room was enveloped in heavy silence, broken only by my wife's ragged sobs. Not a single word escaped her lips. No gratitude, no remorse, just silence. After what felt like an eternity, I grew weary of waiting for her to speak. You traded our marriage for a ski trip worth less than $1,500. That's the value you placed on our dreams. How can I ever trust you again, 
knowing you could abandon us for something so trivial. My plea fell on deaf ears as she remained mute. Tears streamed down my cheeks as I desperately waited for her response, but as the silence persisted, I couldn't bear it any longer. If you had just said, I'm sorry, at any point, I would have torn up this paper, but I can't wait any longer. With a heavy heart, I handed her a copy of the divorce decree. Upon reading it, Maggie let out a piercing scream, prompting the detective to rush back into the room to ensure she was all right. I've already packed my belongings. Anything I left behind is yours to do with as you please, I announced, relinquishing my keys to our, now her, apartment. Without looking back, I walked away, leaving behind the shattered remains of our marriage. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.